Welcome to the PR Resolution Podcast. In this episode, I'm interviewing David Fraser. He's the MD and founder of Ready10, which is an agency based in London. I have been aware of those guys since they launched in 2016. And it was because around that time, I had just authored a book about SEO and PR joining together. And Ready10 had launched and it was a main part of their offering. So I've been watching from afar. The great thing about Ready10 is I feel like... They are just really focused at the task in hand and just doing great work over really PR in themselves. So when you get to hear about them, it's because of the great results rather than just trying to be involved in everything in the industry. And I like that about teams. And whenever I do speak to anybody about Ready10, it's always great positive feedback. I even interviewed somebody yesterday who, actually, let's just talk about it. The next episode is with the marketing director at Secret Cinema. And Simon, he had worked with Ready10 at a previous role and he had said the same. They're just really, really good at driving results. And they've got that great mix of creativity, but also SEO strategy and PR results with those that sort of SEO brought into the measurement. But the reason why I'm talking to David today is because, yet another surprise, they've got a really strong charity and non-profit offering, which I wasn't aware of until I heard about some absolutely amazing work they did with helping to evacuate a number of children from Ukraine when the war began. So... I just needed to speak to David about this project and go, first of all, tell me more about the offering that you're doing. Tell me about that charity work and tell us about this incredible project that they were all, all hands on deck, all heavily involved in. So that's what we're doing. So David covers how the offering has really emerged from the team itself. In fact, it's what started at the beginning of, as COVID hit, as an agency values meeting and many of the team members writing down on a post-it note that they wanted to help people as much as possible. So then cut to a few months later, they're helping to evacuate 54 children from Ukraine on an aircraft. So without further ado, let's hear from David on this. Welcome to the PR Resolution Podcast. Thanks for joining me, David. You're welcome. Good morning, Stella. First of all, let me apologise because I don't know if anybody is watching this rather than listening to it, but I've got these shafts of light coming right down in front of me in this phone booth that I'm in. So it does give an angelic look, which is what I'm going for. But sorry, sorry if that is disturbing you, but I can't seem to do anything about it. I've tried my hardest to get rid of these light shafts. Sorry. (laughs) It's fine. You can beam yourself up at any moment. (laughs) And so I was really excited to have David on, listeners, because I think some of you know that we are doing a bit of a focus on the charity and nonprofit sector. And then I was quite surprised to see this absolutely amazing story project that Ready10 had worked on. So I got in touch with David and said, please tell us more, because I didn't realize that you had a charity and nonprofit offer. So I guess before we get into the amazing projects that I heard about, can you tell us about that offer, please? Okay, so to set the context, we're a consumer agency. We're kind of, I guess, I would never want to call us typical, but I suppose in terms of our structure, history, background, we are pretty typical. We're a consumer PR agency. We're about 35 people now. I know we're going to wind back the clock a bit and sort of I'll try and remember as best as I can the numbers then. But we do regular work as well as a whole bunch of sort of digital PR and other disciplines. We work for the likes of McDonald's and BrewDog and Flora and Ideal Home Show and Paddy Power. So we are in the business of kind of growing and doing fun stuff and entertaining people and moving people and audiences and making a profit. So I do think that context is sort of quite important. We are in the business of being in business, so to speak. But we try and do our bit, I suppose, if that's not too awful and too corny to say. And we always have a little bit. So we've always worked for charity and not-for-profit clients here and there. As I know, many other people have over the years. We've done stuff. If you're a football fan, you might remember Carnu, the footballer for Arsenal and Portsmouth back in the day. 
he is actually a pretty amazing guy with a huge heart foundation. And so we've done work for him in the past and we put on charity games, raising money for kids to have heart operations. And we've worked with an explorer called Jenny Davis, who, you know, for as a pro bono project, who wanted to be the first solo female to trek from the Atlantic to the South Pole. And we've worked for various other charities, but it really came into focus as did many things for many people around the pandemic. And if you have a sort of 45 hours, I'll tell you the story, but I'll try and distill it down to a little bit. So this all came about the day before we got sent home for the pandemic. So if you cast your mind back, and I can't remember all of the dates perfectly, but as far as I can remember, it was the 16th of March. So 16th of March 2020 was the last proper working day before the pandemic. It was kind of, if you remember, there was about 10 days before the actual lockdown where Boris and others were basically saying, you're about to be nailed down to the floor for a long time. So get home and get out of the office. And so the last working day was 16th of March 2020. And things were going quite well for us as a company. But it was a bit scary and it was pretty obvious that this was going to be a bit of a heavy period, very uncertain, and we didn't know what was going to happen. And we have always been pretty values-based. So we've got our five values as an agency, which many people have, commitment, decency, growth, support, and enjoyment. And we really live through that and try and make sure that all our campaigns go through that lens. The day before whatever that version of lockdown was, we sat down as a team and wrote a set of what we then called Corona values because COVID wasn't as used as a term. And I actually found them and I dug them out and I've got them in front of me. We sat down for about an hour and a half and said, it's about to get pretty hairy. What do we want to make sure that we do and what do we want to achieve in that period? And we wrote these five values and pretty much for the next year and a half, we stuck to them. And one of them, there's quite a few about, there was quite a few about sort of making sure that we remained, that we were careful with money and that we delivered and so on. One of them was around assisting others. I've actually got it here in front of me where we say assist others. We can and we should. It's good for the soul and good for the world. We need each other. So we wrote that as a team the day before that. In this period, if we could help people, we were going to help people. We then went home. We started working from home on the 17th of March. And late morning on the 17th of March, I got a phone call. And I got a phone call from Anthony Eskenazi, who's the founder of a firm called Just Park, which is a really successful firm where well, many people will have used it, where you can hire a driveway. If you're driving in somewhere, you can get cheap alternative parking to NCP and traditional car parks. And he said, our business is falling off a cliff. I'm sure you wouldn't mind me saying this now because they have recovered. But basically, obviously, because there was a lockdown coming, people were not driving anywhere. So our business is falling off a cliff. So I don't have any money. But I got a phone call from the Royal Free Hospital in Hampstead last night. And they said to me that they have a real need for parking spaces. They have a need for parking spaces because all medical professionals in hospitals and medical institutions have been called in for the pandemic and we only have so much parking and parking is a fortune so we is there any way you can help with you mobilizing people to give up their driveways and anthony said this to us and i had this in the back of my mind that 24 hours before we'd said if we can assist others we will and we want to help people who are helping others so we worked with just park and we said forget fees. It's not really the time for it. Let's do a campaign. Let's appeal for people to give up their driveways free for NHS staff around the country. They took care of the tech. We took care of the kind of the brand positioning for the campaign, for the publicity. And within two weeks, we had got 20,000 spaces around the UK for NHS staff that people had given up for free. It was on Good Morning Britain, as it was at the time. I think Piers Morgan tweeted about it. I think we got Lord Sugar to tweet about it. It got widespread coverage. And it was the start of what then became and what we call Ready to Help. And Ready to Help is our for good offering, where 
it's a very simple premise. We will help people who are trying to help others. And it sits alongside the work that we already do for brands. And it sort of fits in as and when we can do it. And it's a combination of work for charities, not for profits, but also brands that are trying to do good stuff. And since then, we've done a bunch of stuff. So we did a bunch of stuff in lockdown. Well, that led to work for the Red Cross and Hug, which was a sort of mobile voucher company. We worked for NHS charities who, who released a charity mug to raise funds with, that was designed by Quentin Blake. Worked for a mobile carers charity called Mobilize in the pandemic. And that has continued after as well. Fast forward to today, where we work for the likes of Youth Music. We've done a couple of Race for Life for Cancer Research UK. Um, we've just finished just before, well, just before Christmas, a few months back, a really big project for a an anti extremism charity called Hope Not Hate. So, ready to help was yeah. that formed? And I know you said you were doing some charity work before this sort of stronger value and and that particular project at the beginning of COVID. But was Ready Ten sort of really developed? during covid or was that like the service offer before as well yeah there was no service offer as such before covid it was i guess occasionally you're asked can you do stuff and it sort of maybe catches your eye a little bit and you might help and then about a week after we did the just park thing we said well maybe there's something in this and maybe we should make it bigger so it was a service offering that we formed in I guess it would have been a week into lockdown. We put it out there. We publicized it. I guess this ties into how we were as a business in lockdown. We tying in with all those other values and a lot of the values were around setting an example to each other and looking after each other. And we wanted to do that with the team. As a consequence, we didn't take any furlough money. We didn't make any redundancies. We didn't make any pay cuts and we paid all our bonuses. Now, we were in a very fortunate position that just about we could afford to do that. Basically, our profits took a hit. Our income, like many others, fell through the floor overnight. I think we lost 40% overnight. But we wanted to remain firm on looking after each other and looking after the team. And if we didn't have to take money from the government, we didn't. We weren't going to. And we made that decision. And that translated through, really to the for good offering what ready to help came and so we then put some welly behind that put some resource behind that launched that and the call started coming in and we were really pleased to be able to help a lot of people i mean you must have really looked after your business beforehand to be able to not take the government money still be able to pay bonuses and then take on a charity no fee project as well i mean that's quite something yes well congrats congratulations there's Thank not many you. agencies that could have done that. Someone said to me at the time, when the tide goes out, you can see who's been swimming with their pants down or words to that effect. And yeah, I would like to think we did manage it well before. I am just being honest, right? I'm not a holier than now person. I do think. You look it I... with the light, by the way. You look holy with the light. Thank, coming you. Down. <laughs> Thank you. That's why I'm going for it. I often think, well, did we do the right thing not taking furlough money? Because everyone else did. And what took a hit was profit, ultimately. But I do come back to, we didn't have to. Just because we could didn't mean we should. And we didn't have to. And we just about scraped by. So moving on to your decision to go with the Just Park project, absolutely amazing. You were able to say, don't worry, we're on this, no fees. How yeah. have you managed other charities coming in or other projects coming in that you've really wanted to help i mean do you say no fee for all of them like how does it work no not all of them are no fees many people work for charities and get paid yeah. a fee and that's right and that's reasonable and in the same way that if we can do it if we can help people we should i also think the same applies on the other side yes if they can pay us then they should now we have a huge charity discount that we offer. And sometimes charities will say, and I guess we're probably going to come on to it, stuff like Project Light, they will often say there is no fee. So we would love your help, but we haven't got anything. And we will just take that judgment as it comes. As you can imagine, in lockdown, most of those charities weren't able to pay us. 
but perhaps were able to kind of, I don't know, do stuff for us in other ways, maybe run a training session for us, something like that. With a lot of the charity work we do, not all of it is unpaid. And in those cases, yeah, there is a sort of standard charity discount that we apply mm. as well. It does depend. I guess, I don't know if this is a, a, a guess but and a generalisation, but is it tend to be that more of the emergency style projects don't have the fees, whereas pre-planned ongoing causes do have the budget? I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. When you've got a call saying we have to do an airlift to, well, we'll talk about the, the Ukraine. Let's go. Fund. Let's okay. go. This Fine. is the pro- so listeners. This is the project that I noticed, and I just absolutely captivated by it. Really moved by the story, but then said, "I didn't know. I thought Ready Ten were really good at digital PR and consumer big campaigns. <laughs> How did they get this aircraft together? So which yeah, is, tell, which tell is, us about it. <laughs> which is sort of crisis work, right? I guess yeah. and crisis and issues. So as a sort of sidebar, ten years of my life before this was working with Alan Sugar. I was his PR guy for 10 years. And uh-huh. that is a masterclass in issues and crisis every day for 10 years, quite often of Twitter's making for whatever reason. But things like that, that in my previous life, at my previous agency, that actually led to a hell of a lot of high-level crisis and issues work for kind of him, but also the likes of Whitbread and Whitbread Restaurants and Premier Inn and other brands as well. And that I mentioned that as context for this because this is what this project ended up doing. So ended up being. So Project Light, I mean, the most rewarding, bruising, taxing project I've ever worked on. And I'll I'll explain what it is. I guess the too long didn't read bit is we sitted in an airlift of 54 Ukrainian orphans and their carers from Poland to the UK. Longer story <laughs> is I was that typical PR person. I was at a PR party. Yay. I was at a sort of drinks reception thing in March, about March 15th, 20. And this was two and a half weeks after Russia invaded Ukraine. And I left the party. I was on my way to the tube and my phone rang and I picked it up and it was a friend of mine who assists with some stuff for a charity from time to time. That charity was called Mug and Dove Dom UK and they are a sort of Red Cross affiliated humanitarian charity. And he said that M- MDA UK, along with another charity called Save a Child and another charity called Dnipro Kids, which was a kids, a charity in Scotland who sponsored an orphanage in Ukraine, were pulling together an airlift of 61 Ukrainian refugees, so that's 54 orphans plus their carers, uh, to come to the UK and reach a safe haven. We don't. We think it's going to be a big story, he said. We have no PR support whatsoever. We basically don't really know what we're doing. We're, ma- we're sort of making up as we go along in a good way. Virgin are talking about getting on board and providing a flight, but ah, we need a bit of help managing it what do you think there's no budget can you help and i didn't really need to think about it because i think 100 out of 100 people would say the same thing which is this is shit what's happening in the world and yes of course we can that was quarter to 10 five past 10 i was on a conference call with all the clients talking about what this was going to happen i woke my colleague sophie up i gave her a quick call we got on this call and literally the next 10 days were a whirlwind of trying to get these kids out of Poland and into the UK. Now, context is now, as we sit here a year later, we're used to lots of Ukrainians being here. We've got the Homes for Ukraine scheme, all the rest of it. At that point, no Ukrainian had set foot on British soil. So this hadn't been done before. It was a complete unknown, and there was loads of red tape to get over. To give you an idea of the context, there were four governments that needed to be talked through it. So there was the Ukrainian government, who understandably wanted to protect their own citizens and make sure they weren't just being sent anywhere. So huge child protection issues for them. The Polish government, the same. The English or British government and the Scottish government, because these kids were going to end up living in Edinburgh. So all of a sudden... Within 24 hours, I was on calls with Ian Blackford, the head of the SNP in Westminster, who was passionately sort of shouting down the phone to me at what needed to be done. 
And all of a sudden, the refugees minister, Richard Harrington, was part of our group. And we, I had gone from being a very nice sort of drinks reception in central London on the Tuesday to being in the middle of this huge thing. And effectively, we became deputy heads of that mission. We had to manage all the press, all the comms, because it's a child protection issue. We knew it was going to be a big story. We knew it was going to be on the front pages of everything. But there was so much to do. It, it was crazy. And this was only 10 days, right? But what are 10 days? This podcast is brought to you by Coverage Book, the tool that creates beautifully designed reports with credible metrics you can be proud of. Head to coveragebook.com for your free trial. I know that your friend said we just need sort of support. At that point, did they say we need you to act as a liaison between the parties? We need you to just talk to press. We need you to do internal comms. Like, was there like a more sort of specific brief of the the role of PR people in this? No, the the brief was we need comms support because we know it's okay. going to be a big story. But then as things unravel, if anyone has been in a crisis. How can I put this without being mean to people? When you are in a crisis situation, some people go in themselves a little bit and lose confidence and actually don't do what's best for that project. And at those points, you require the people that maybe have got a little bit of experience or maybe have done it before and come to the fore. And also, you don't have time to say, oh, we need to appoint a head of strategic communications or, oh, we need someone to work through the logistics. You're like, Sophie will do it. She's done it before. She can do it. Or I'll call Ian Blackford because somebody needs to. Or I'll call the Department for Children's Family Affairs in Ukraine because someone has to. And that's really how it happens. Your role starts quite small And then it emerges a load of stuff needs to be done. Right. So it was really busy, right? It was 10 days. But this is March and we're a PR agency and we have clients. Now, in March, there's two weeks in March, which are a bloody nightmare for us, which is the week around Cheltenham because we work for Paddy Power and Cheltenham Festival is huge. And the Cheltenham Festival week is the same week as Ideal Home Show. An ideal home show for us is huge. So our staff are pretty exhausted anyway. And I had to, I should give a shout out. There's two clients in particular I had to call and say, we're doing this. And they were amazing. One of them was Rob Nathan, who's our client at the ideal home show. And this is with the show on. They've got to sell tickets. And I said, Rob, we we have been asked to do this and we have to do it. You're still going to get everything that you asked for, but I might need to pull with the odd person here, the odd person there to do it. And imagine, imagine if I said this about any other piece of work and he said, you just got to do it, do what you need to do. And I will be so grateful to those clients who understood that they needed to allow us to do this unpaid piece of work. Were your results affected for Ideal Home Show? No. Nope record year i mean this is what happens with people right you find you find you find it within yourself somehow to kind of do it all and our clients were amazing the clients that we had to tell were just brilliant and then we also had to tell our families because pr is busy as you will know but i existed in my house for 10 days but that was about it i pretty much did not say another word to my family, to my wife, my kids. I was physically there, but otherwise it was 7 a.m. till 2.30 a.m. days for 10 days, upstairs, working through it. Can't concentrate on anyone else. I remember, this is quite funny, I remember on the Sunday, my little boy plays football and I helped with the team and I did manage to get a couple of hours out. And I went to like coach the team and help the team and the phone rang in the middle of the match and I was expecting a call from Sky News who were going to be on the flight to take the kids back and it was James I think his name's James Masters Scottish correspondent and I answered it I was like ah hi James and it was a mum on the football team asking where they should park in the car park (laughs) are you on the flight (laughs) yet I know right so and then like this whole period was just nuts. So to sum up how nuts it was, I went to Poland for three hours. I think on the Friday before the mission, 
I went to Warsaw Airport to have a meeting with the Warsaw Airport press office about things like when the kids were coming through, what journalists would, wouldn't be able to do, what images could and couldn't be captured, passes and so on. I literally flew into Warsaw Airport, had a meeting for three hours, flew back out. That is how crazy this thing was. Was it just UK press that were interested in the story? It was all those four countries mainly. I think there was some stuff in mainland Europe, and I think there was a couple of bits in the US, but it was a huge, huge deal for whatever there was functioning in the relevant sections of Ukrainian media, but in particular Poland and in particular Scotland and mainstream British press. So we basically had to help organise everything. So the flights and Virgin were amazing. Virgin don't fly to Warsaw. So all of a sudden they had to scramble things like flight plan. They had to find a crew that speak Polish because why would any of their crew speak Polish when they don't fly to Warsaw? Manifests, what's going to be on that plane if there's any aid going out, which there was some aid going out. Who's going to be on there? Child protection issues, like lists and lists and lists of things that need to be worked through. When the kids arrive, what is happening? Are they staying in London or are they going straight on to Scotland? If they're going straight on to Scotland, is there going to be an, another flight that takes them there? All the while, managing this media appetite where media is starting to get wind of this is obviously going to be a big story and they're phoning the whole time. What can we do? What can we do? What can we do? And understand, like, how can we cover it? And understanding how we're going to do that. We got to, I think it was the Monday, the flight day, and it was actually one of the worst days I've ever experienced. And why it was one of the worst days I've ever experienced is the flight didn't go. It was aborted. Uh, we all got to the airport. There was going to be, uh, there was a few kind of representatives of the charity and stuff like that on the flight out. Very excited. Our job was basically to spend a lot of time in airports. And I think we spent a hell of a lot of time in Heathrow. Turn up at the airport, see them off, looking up at the board, delayed, 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 delayed. And what had transpired was that the Ukrainian authorities were not adequately satisfied with the paperwork to release the kids, to allow them to go, which is fair enough. But it was sickening and it was like a real body blow because ultimately this is about helping 61 people reach safety. And I have never cried in my job before or since, but it was just awful. And what we had to do is, I don't imagine anyone has really ever done this or very often is because we were airside at Heathrow. We had to walk through passport control, knowing this flight hadn't gone, knowing there was uncertainty of it. We had members of the SNP there. We had all sorts of politicians there. Right. We had to walk through feeling sick to our stomach. And then passport control says, where have you been today? <laughs> and we say, we've been to Pret and Boots in your departure lounge and that's it. And now we're coming back out and we all got back to the room that the Hilton that Heathrow had donated for the media. And basically as a team, we we pretty much all shed a tear, had a hug, cried, and we didn't know what was going to happen. What well, did they outline what they needed? Were you able to jump on it? Or, or was yes. it just a no? Just a yes. Stats, no. no, 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 no. It was, there was two bits of paperwork that were not in to satisfy them that they should go. So if you're the, and, and I completely understand, if you're the Ukrainian Department for Family Affairs, you don't just want 61 of your citizens going somewhere random with God knows who on the other side of Europe. Completely understand. But these things, everybody's dealing in different languages. And for whatever reason, this paperwork wasn't in. The next day, loads of phone calls. Six o'clock Tuesday, it was. Paperwork is in. Right, great. We can go. The flight went the following day. So it kind of went. It, it We went on the flight. So I'm sort of only going from what, people say but it landed in warsaw did a turnaround some aid that was going in the other direction went off these kids who are terrified but also excited come on i'm told it was there's kind of tiktoks and stuff that are around and if anybody is interested i think there's a case study on our website that's got the tiktok on it if not people can ask me for it and they they got here and they came back and they landed on british soil and it was like joyous. It was just the release of so much emotion because it was the hardest, most bruising like project I've ever worked on. 
in these situations, everybody is generally pulling in the right direction, but that doesn't mean there isn't a lot of conflict and a lot of difficulty and a lot of arguments. And so it turned out to be the case. And then they went on to Scotland. I've never met any one of these kids that has come through. They turned our lives upside down in a good way for 10 days, but they were straight on to Scotland and, and they're still there. They're still there yeah. and they're, they're developing really well. And the charities that, that did this work and pulled this together, along with Virgin Atlantic, just absolutely remarkable bunch of people. And it was a privilege to be involved and to help do that. Yeah. Amazing. You just saying that they're still, they're doing well. I mean, that's the measurement gauge you need really, isn't it? I've got loads of questions about the media shortly, but the important thing is that they're there doing well. Do you get any updates? Like, did they go into foster care? Like, what happens? Yeah, so, right, that's the KPI, isn't it? You yeah, know, exactly, when... <laughs> exactly. And that's the measurement. I always have to talk about measurement on, the, on this show and like, that's it. We can talk well, about media and stuff. But I do have questions more from a crisis perspective and different, yeah, well, come on to yeah. it. But yeah. the important thing is what's yeah, happening so that, to the kids. Yes, yeah, so Denis Pro Kids, which is the charity that I mentioned before, they are the ones that hosted them. And I believe with Edinburgh City Council to make sure that they could go into family units. So I should explain When we say 54 orphans, it's not exactly how we would necessarily term an orphan. It's effectively a child that their parents are not their legal guardians anymore. And they lived in children's home in what was called family units. And you'll notice I keep saying the figure of 61 and 54. 61 is the total number of people, 54 kids. So there were seven adults. And those seven adults are their legal guardians and carers. And they are in seven separate groups. And those family groups live together in accommodation in Edinburgh. So they're sort of all they're all at school and the adults are in work, but they're living in those family groups looked after by the charity. And if anybody wants to look up that charity, Denipro Kids, they can do and, and they're doing remarkable work with them in, up in wow. Scotland. Interesting. Yeah. How are they housed? Is that all in the case study that we can look up? So I don't know the specifics of yeah. that. Because our, basically, the second they flew back flew on to scotland our yeah. job was done yeah yeah but so it, i think does... there's lots of information there and people can donate to that charity as well to help with things like outings and trips and stuff that they're doing but if you follow them on social media the families are doing amazingly and and i think it's also important to emphasize it is everybody's hope including the people in scotland that this is temporary at such time that it's safe to go back to ukraine everyone is going back. And if I remember rightly, that was one of the pieces of paperwork, that that was one of the conditions that needed to be satisfied on behalf of the Ukrainian government. Interesting. So getting on that again, that relates to my question. So the media relations, were you announcing this or by the time you came in, were media aware of it? And as part of that, I'm really, really interested to know the kind of information that the Scottish media wanted in comparison to media based elsewhere, if there was a difference? Well, there was a difference. And the difference was the Scottish media knew a lot about these kids and this charity already because the local charity up in Scotland had followed them. So we worked with the Scottish media, but they also had kind of various relationships and routes in. It meant a lot more to them. Media became aware of this everywhere on all sides. So at that time, there was lots of correspondence for national news networks out in Poland. ITV News followed this group and they're them trying to get to the UK for about a week in leading up to it. Sally Becker is a lady who is the CEO of Save a Child. She's pretty well known. She's actually the lady that went in and got these kids out. She has done this work for decades I think she's up from your old stomping ground in Brighton, actually, but she's very well known for this sort of work. And so she has a profile and has been followed by media. And so everybody knew we were doing this. The key issue was, like it always is, messaging. We want to get the right stuff out across, but also child protection. We're still dealing with children. And so how do you balance the fact that this is a huge news story with the fact that most of the people in it are under 16 and can't talk English and are quite scared and so on and so forth. So the protection, child protection issue was the biggest sort of 
media consideration. But there was a huge hunger for it. We knew that coverage numbers was never going to be an issue. I think it was the front page of three or four newspapers when we landed. And there are things like create, making sure that the photography's right and so on. But really, it was about controlling that message, protecting the families mm. and the charities as well. So, yeah, what was the different kind of messaging between Scottish versus, was it supportive? That, was it all is good? That, is that a nice way of saying I didn't <laughs> answer your question? Everyone was supportive. There was just a lot yeah. more depth in Scotland and a lot okay. more localization because they knew about these kids. There was obviously, with the Edinburgh Press, where are they going to live? What are they going to yeah. do? Who's going to That's who the is, kind of detail I asked as well. How are they housed? Yeah, like what, what happens next? It's like the, the amazing story of them actually getting here. But yeah, and then what happens next, I guess, is the, the extra detail, isn't it? Yeah, well, like I say, they're in a, they seem to be in a pretty good place. There's news articles from time to time on this group of kids. If, Like I say, if anyone does want to find out more, it's uh, Dnipro Kids is a, is a really good charity and, and people, if they've got a few quid, should donate to it. I, yeah, I would thoroughly definitely. recommend that. I'll put the details in the in the show notes. Sure. And in that short space of time, were you able to pull together messaging, press releases? <laughs> were yeah. You all just working yeah. On the so with that? yes. So we did some training for the kind of key people that we were dealing with. So as soon as they got off the plane, Sally from Save a Child, Daniel from Mug and Dover Dom kind of came to the hotel and did media. We effectively had a media junket at the hotel straight after because people wanted to know what had happened. And so they came over to the Hilton Hotel and ran through a whole bunch of interviews. And I think we did CNN and we did BBC and I think we did ITV and various newspaper interviews for the following day. There was, these are people whose, the, 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 the campaign spokespeople effectively are busy helping people day to day. They're not so used to media. So there was a lot of media training that needed to be done. There was a lot of scenario planning documents that were written. So if this does, if this mission fails, if they don't get here, if they do get here, if some of the group get here, but some of them don't, what are we going to say? There was a whole political game, if I'm honest, to manage with, gosh, who was prime minister at the time it was quite a while ago now it was boris johnson yeah definitely was wasn't it we've had about 17 prime ministers in the last two years there was a little bit of politics to manage between the smp the government and also the refugees minister richard harrington who is cross-party i believe as well so there was a lot of like calls with him who's going to be able to say what who should would be the right person to speak here who are the right media to go with but it was, I mean, to illustrate sort of how deep into the consciousness this got, it was brought up in Parliament the following day at the mission. Yeah. So it was talked through in Parliament, pretty oh. Patel tweeted about it and brought it up in Parliament the following day. I think Richard Branson did some stuff because Virgin was across it and it, it was covered everywhere. Yeah. We said like that KPIs obviously they're safely in Scotland and they're good. But with that project or with other emergency projects, do you go into any kind of wrap up or like looking at the analysis of the messaging or was it because it was there was no fee and it didn't go wrong that you just say thank you and, and move on? Like how do you wrap up a project like that? Yeah, we did. I think we want to do that anyway. As an agency, we sort of track everything since the beginning. So every piece right. of coverage, more or less, is tracked. We did do a campaign wrap up. Of course, key KPI is that, like we said, they're here. They're here and they're safe. But yeah, we did go through stuff when we had a moment to breathe. And to be fair to the clients that we had responsibilities to, they then got a lot of love in the few days after. But yeah, we did do a campaign wrap up. Do you do a different kind of analysis to your normal consumer campaigns when you're doing this kind of charity work? Yeah, I think it's not really a numbers game in any way. No one really cares about the number of pieces or that kind of thing. It's more about has the message been delivered? Did we fulfill all our objectives? So an objective was child protection. An objective was getting the kids here. An objective was positive media coverage or at the very best neutral 
and that was all fulfilled. There was no negative in terms of kind of like drilling down into things like sentiment analysis or number of links. No, not relevant necessarily to this campaign. Really, really interesting to look into that. So what is next for your charity and nonprofit offer? So the way that we do it is it's to an element ad hoc, right? So we have our paying clients and we have like kind of amazing brand work that we love doing. At the same time, that value that we talked about of kind of helping others remains Number one. Number two, we're a predominantly Gen Z employer. And young people in particular want to do stuff that matters and they want their stuff to be varied. And as well as, I love selling burgers for McDonald's. And I also really enjoy the work that we do for brands like Paddy Power. And I want to do that. But me and them also want to do other stuff that may be a slightly deeper dive and more meaningful. And so we're always on the lookout for that kind of work. It has led, as a his, as an agency, we've very rarely gone out to look for the work. In fact, never. We've kind of never done a big piece of outreach. The phone tends to ring because once you do a certain work in a certain style with a certain accent, other people notice it and ring it. So actually, the ready for help stuff is self-fulfilling in that people have seen that we're doing this and the phone rings. So like I said, since then, we're working for Youth Music, a really, really important youth music charity. We're doing stuff for Race for Life for Cancer Research UK. Mug and David Adam called again with the a couple of months back, and we did, I suppose, a project like number two, much, much simpler this time. So this was around the earthquake that hit the Turkey-Syria border, and they were sending aid in the other direction. So we did the comms for that a couple of months back. Much simpler three-day piece of work effectively organizing kind of some photography and and liaising with charities that were sending the aid out and kind of some spokesperson comment much much simpler stuff to do but we were very happy to jump on board with that people want to do this as part of their work we want to do it if we can we feel it's important to help other people still and so we're sort of open for business for it really is maybe the simplest way to put it well, the listeners have heard it here. If people need a plane, we know who to call. <laughs> no. Virgin. <laughs> <laughs> Jokes aside, David, like listening to that whole story, but I think the big thing for me is that you guys had successfully managed your agency for quite some time for it to be able to be in a really stable position to be able to then open the door and help those kind of organizations in need and at the same time be so open and in touch with all employees that everybody has a voice to say I want to work on this kind of thing and then you've got the the passion you've got the passion right there who are people willing to go over and above on hours and work to pull together something like that so like massive congrats on both of those those elements because they're not easy to do in an agency so well done. <laughs> it's an amazing Thank story. You. Thank you. And yeah, if any, look, we're always open to hear if, if anyone's kind of got an interesting project, not for profit or from a brand, we're always happy to hear about it. Hopefully they can do a bit of both. All right, David, thank you so, Thanks, so Stella. much. All right, see you soon. Yeah.